Good day to everyone. For this day, we are going to talk on the generations of computer. To start with this lesson, the following learning objectives are established. You should be able to differentiate the different generations of computer. You should be able to describe and identify their inven the inventions and their inventors for each generation of computer. Make sure you have with you your lecture notebook, assessment notebook, black ball pen, and an intermediate paper. Now, this activity is intended for you to gain an insight onto a vacuum-based monitor. Use your assessment notebook to answer this part. Well, are you familiar with a CRT TV, the one which is presented into the, into the screen? Well, does it heat up quickly after three hours of continuous usage? What about an LCD monitor? Does it, heat, he, does it heat up more quickly as compared to CRT monitor? Well, I want you to answer again this part in your assessment notebook. Now, if you were to choose between a CRT monitor and an LCD monitor, which one would you choose and why? Well, this activity is again designed for you to describe different generations of computer and use your notebook, assessment notebook, to answer this part. Well, how do you classify the computers that we are now using? Is it a first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth or fifth generation computer? And how do you characterize each generation of computer? The history of computer development is often referred to as the different generations of computing devices. When you say generations of computer, it refers to the different advancements of new computer technology. With each new generation, its circuitry is getting smaller and more advanced than the previous miniaturization, speed, power, and computer memory have proportionally increased. Hence, nowadays, computers are becoming more portable. When you say again generation, it talks about the state of improvement in the product development process. So each generation comes with a new improvement or development of the computer. And hence, these computers are now classified as first generation second, third, fourth, and after the present, we now have the so-called the fifth generation computers. But before going to the fifth generation computer, let us first understand the characteristics of its forerunner generations of computer, which are the first, second, third, and fourth generation. The first, uh, the, in the first generation computer, this, uh, this has begun in the year 1907 when Dr. Lee DeForest invented the vacuum tubes. And hence, with the invention of vacuum tubes, paves the way for the first computers to be developed. The vacuum tubes are electronic valves about the size of a light bulb, which consist of electrodes and wires in an evacuated glass bulb. And then these tubes were used to regulate electric currents or electric signals. Well, generally, these vacuum tubes are used to re regulate the electric currents or electric signals. And in the first, computers used vacuum tubes for electricity and magnetic drums for memory. So with these components, the first generation computers has been developed. It consists of two major components, which are your vacuum tubes for circuitry and magnetic drums for memory. So, mean to say, class, in the first generation computers, you cannot see those electronic boards. There are no electronic boards in the first generation computers because you are still using your vacuum tubes. Okay? Inside the vacuum tubes, that is this, that, that is an evacuated gas. So, mean to say, class, 
there's no air in it. And since it conducts electricity, it produces heat. While the vacuum tubes can be very hot while the computer is in use. And they were often enormous and taking up entire rooms. The magnetic drums were once used as primary storage. And a single magnetic drum can hold up to 200 tracks assigned to a channel located around the drum's circumference, forming adjacent circular bands that wind around the drum. And then the input and output media are punch cards and magnetic tapes. And here's how a vacuum tube looks like. But then class, take note that in the first generation, generation computers, it is not just a single vacuum tube, but there were thousands of these vacuum tubes put together in order for the computer to work. And that is how the first generation computers have been developed. And examples of the first generation computers are the following. First, we have your ENIAC, or the so-called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, which was invented in the year 1943 by John Mockley and Pisper Eckert Jr. It is the world's first operational general purpose electronic digital computer, and it can perform about 5,000 5, calculations per second that consists of about 18,000 vacuum tubes. If you could imagine having that vacuum tubes of around 18,000 and how high is the temperature when this ENIAC would put into operation, and that is how your first generation computer looks like. It consists of thousands of vacuum tubes. And as we have known that vacuum tubes, as they operate, dissipates more heat. How about it ha having an 18,000 vacuum tubes? Well, that, that temperature can be very high while this computer is in use. In Yak is, however, heavy. Since it weighed more than 30 tons, imagine 30 tons, and occupied 180 square feet and consumed about 200 kilowatts of power. And it composed of 30 separate units with additional power supplies and cooling units. So as we have known that vacuum tubes really dissipate more heat. Therefore, it needs these cooling units to prevent the computer from being overheat. It consumes large amount of electricity. Imagine of having a 200 kilowatts of power. So it's uh, really consume a lot of electricity. So here's a figure of how ENIAC looks like. Then from ENIAC, it has been improved into the so-called as EDVAC or the Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Computer, wherein it has some of the essential designs and innovation made by John von Neumann based on ENIAC developed, developed by Mockley and E. Kurt. And then one advancement of EDVAC is that it only consumed 30% of the ENIAC's vacuum tubes and was, must, and was much faster in speed. For steel class, it consumes large amount of electricity due to the presence of vacuum tubes. At the same time, since the vacuum tube is still there, it still dissipates more heat, which makes it which makes the first generation computers prone for overheating. Well, as compared to ENIAC, EDVAC is of course a more advanced compared to that. Hence, it was more faster in speed, and it was the first program computer which employed binary arithmetic for simpler circuitry and stored program capability. So again, as we have known that it is now able to perform binary arithmetic. Binary consists of ones and zero for simpler, simpler circuitry. And here's how your EDVAC looks like. From EDVAC, from EDVAC 
it has been further improved into the so-called as UNIVAC or the so-called the Universal Automatic Computer wherein it is the first commercial computer dev delivered to a business client the U.S. Census Bureau in the year 1951 where it still contained about 5,000 vacuum tubes much lesser as compared to ENIAC and EDVAC but still it makes use of vacuum tubes and thus it, is, it dissipates more heat and which occupied about 943 cubic feet and weighed of 8 tons so if you can imagine how heavy having a weight of 8 tons so this is how your univac looks like well as we have known that the use of vacuum tubes posed many disadvantages some of these problems includes having more ext extensive, required more energy, dissipated more heat, and prone to failures. So with this problem identified, especially prone to failures and prone for overheating, the vacuum tubes has been replaced. Well, in the second generation, vacuum tubes has now been replaced with transistors. So transistors provides the way for miniaturization of our technologies nowadays. Hence, without invention of a transistors, we we'll still be using those vacuum tubes computers. But thankfully, transistors has been developed and computing as of today is becoming more portable. And since it no longer has a vacuum tubes, it does not need a hot filament to generate electrons. Thus, thus, it is no longer prone for overheating because there is no hot filament inside your vacuum tubes. And of course, they were far more superior compared to vacuum tubes as they are not prone for overheating and they are and they consume less electricity. Their small size, low heat generation, high reliability, and small power requirements made it possible for the miniaturization a complex circuitry required by computers and as a result the size of electronic machinery has been shrinking ever since so as we have known class that nowadays computers are becoming more portable and it, thankfully it is because of the invention of transistors well the invention doesn't stop until transistors transistors were further combined to create now our super and very portable computers. Well, when you say transistor, there is actually a device which is composed of semiconductor material which amplifies a signal or opens or closes a circuit. And it has now become a, the critical ingredient of all digital circuits including computers and it is safe to say that without the invention of transistor computing as we have known today would not be possible hence without transistors we are still using those big computers and here's how your transistor looks like well the transistor has became the fundamental building block for all modern computers just as cells as the building block of any living organisms and the foundation for microchip and computer technology. So your transistor paved way for the invention of your processor. In a modern computer, it is rare to find any individual transistors. That is because every integrated circuit contains a vast number of transistors. For example, a memory location will have a pair of transistors so that there are 16 of them for each byte. And for each megabyte of memory, there are a million transistors. At the same time, your transistors are found or integrated into our central processor or the central processor which is responsible for performing all the calculations and other processes for your computer and a transistor is again 
and your processor is not just a single transistor but it consists of millions of transistors miniaturized and placed inside your central processor. As integrated circuits has been developed, each transistor size gets smaller, so they can be more packed into a single chip, but they are doing the same jobs as individual transistors that will be used to build excellent state computers. And during this period, the second generation, the stored program and programming language gave computers the flexibility to be finally the cost effective and productive. The stored program concept means that instructions can be run on specific function held inside your computer's memory. Hence, computers in the second generation is now capable of executing programs because of your transistors. And then at the same time, the program stored inside your memory can be quickly replaced by a set of instructions for different functions. Thus, one can now, can now install program. One can now execute different instructions for a computer to the use of your transistors. But then the invention of transistor doesn't end the miniaturization, miniaturization of today's technology. Transistors were further developed and has now become more advanced than it used to be. Perhaps in the third generation of computer, the transistors have now been integrated to form an integrated circuit or what we call as the IC. So the invention of your integrated circuit paves the way for the third generation computers. It started in the year 1958 when Jack Kelby demonstrated that it was possible to integrate the various components. In this generation, we still make use of transistors, but then these transistors were then miniaturized and were placed in a single silicon chip, which is known as your semiconductors. Because these computer chips were called integrated circuits, they combined multiple electronic circuits on the same chip. As a complete circuit, the integrated circuit enabled lower cost and faster processors and memory elements to be built that drastically increased computer speed and efficiency. So here's an example of your how your integrated circuit looks like. But then take note class that inside your integrated circuit are your transistors which are miniaturized. The IC technology, it refers to the ability to photographically imprint the circuit to contain many transistors and fabricate many transistors in a single chip. So in a single integrated circuit class, again, it contains thousands of transistors. And to make it possible for the transistor to be integrated into a single circuit inside your IC, it makes use of your IC technology to contain uh, to, it is the ability to photographically imprint the circuit to contain many transistors and fabricate many transistors on single chip. So single chip consists of thousands of transistors. The first ICs or integrated circuits had only tens of transistors per chip as compared to tens of millions per chip, typically of today's CPU. Now, CPU class, again, consists of millions now of transistors combined together to make the CPU even more powerful than it used to be. Then, along with the development of your integrated circuit, the development also of operating system takes place where it allows the machine to run many different programs at once with a single with a central program which monitored and coordinated the computer's memory. So this is also one hallmark of your third generation computers, the invention or the development of your operating system. The first modern operating system provided a sound intermediary 
between software and its hardware is the Unix OS. So it, it is the first operating system ever built, the Unix OS. So Robert Noyce, who is also one of the inventors of integrated circuit, at the same time the founder of Intel Corporation, commented on modern computer compared to NFS. IC is 20 times faster, has a larger memory, is thousands of times more reliable, consumes the power of a light bulb rather than that of a locomotive, and which occupies one over 30,000 of the volume and cost as much as 1 over 10,000 as compared to NIAC. As we have known class that NIAC is very expensive and at the same time it costs a lot to operate your NIAC as it consumes a lot of electricity. Well, the, the invention of integrated circuit has been further improved and lead to another series of generations of computer which is now which brought forth your fourth generation. Pro steel class, it is through the invention of your transistor which paves the way for the development of integrated circuit and from integrated circuit it was further improved and developed into microprocessor or this is now your computer's CPU. The invention of your microprocessor brought forth the fourth generation of computers as thousands of integrated circuits were built on a single silicon chip. Since there are now thousands of ICs on a single silicon chip, it made the computers even more powerful. Okay? From a single transistor combined together to form an integrated circuit and then this integrated circuit were combined together to form your microprocessor and in the fourth generation it is now called as your VLSI or the so-called your very large scale integration which began in the year 1970s and VLSI or the very large scale integration is a process of creating ICs by combining thousands of transistors onto a single chip so this single microprocessor contains thousands of integrated circuits within this microprocessor. And then the, the very first integrated circuits held only two, two transistors each, making it possible to fabricate one or more logic gates on a single device, is now known re re retrospectively as SSI or the so-called the small-scale integration. Then from the small-scale integration, there is an improvement made in this technique to lead which lead to devices with hundreds of logic gates. Single logic gate, one or more logic gate that is single that is small-scale integration. Having hundreds of logic gates paved the way for MSI or the medium scale integration. Then a logic gate, when we say logic gate, it is actually a logical device in a computer with one output channel and one or more input channels that emits a signal only when a specific conditions are met. Hence it is called as logic gate. So there are conditions that must be satisfied before a signal will be emitted into your logic gate. So this is logical thinking. So there is true or false. That is what you call your logic gate. And this signal can only be emitted if the result of the logic gate is true. Otherwise, a signal will not be produced. And further, improvements le led to the development of large-scale integration. When we say large-scale integrations, these are systems which at least have a thousand logic gates. From small scale integration having only one logic gate, the hundreds of logic gate, we call that one as medium scale integration, with a thousand logic gates that is now large scale integration. 
and current technology has moved far from this mark. So from thousand of logic gates, we now have millions of logic gates. And now what we call your VLSI or the very large scale integration of the fourth generation. Now here are some technological advancements in the fourth generation of computers. In the year 1971, this is the time when the first microprocessor was developed by Ted Hoff and was introduced by Intel. In the year 1973, this year started the development of the Internet. And the father of Internet is Vinton Cerf or Vin Cerf. In the year 1975, the MITS relay released Alder Basic, which was developed by our college dropouts Bill Gates and Paul Allen, who then founded the Microsoft company in the year 1976. The same year, 1976, the Cray-1 supercomputer, which is the fastest, most powerful computer of its time has been developed. In the year 1979, three years after the, super, the Cray-1 supercomputer has been developed, the world star has been created by Robert Barnaby. So the, the, the word star is the forerunner of our Microsoft Word. So before Microsoft Word has been developed, we use your word star. Then in the year 1981, the first IBM PC was introduced for use in home, offices, and schools. And in the year 1983, the Lutus 1.2.3 has been released, which is a spreadsheet program much like of our Microsoft Excel for microcomputers. Then a year after the HP or Hewlett Packard introduced your laser jet printer for personal computers. So take note class that in the year 1981 the IBM PC has now been used, was now in release. Hence in the year 1984 HP produces their Laser jet printer for PC. Then, in the year 1985, the Cray 2 supercomputer has been used for mathematical studies of very complex problems. For example, we have your speech analysis and weather forecasting. And the same year, in the year 1985, Microsoft also introduced their Windows operating system. And in the year 1989, the World Wide Web has been developed, and it was Timothy Berners-Lee or Tim Berners-Lee, who was known as the father of the and father of the World Wide Web. Then, in the year 1991, the palm top computer has been invented by Steve Jobs, which then he founded the Apple Corporation. And the year 1992, the Pinchon computer was announced. As the rooms became a more popular storage medium, in the year 1997, the first IBM machine called as a Deep Blue Supercomputer was invented and was entitled to make 100 million chess points per second and which beats Gary Kasparov who was the reigning chess champion. So those are some of the technological advancement of the fourth generation of computer. And currently, or now in progress, are the computers belonging to the fifth generations, or the 5G. These fifth generation computers or technologies are now capable of build using your artificial intelligence, or they are now capable of performing artificial intelligence or AI, the were robots. So, as we have known, now the first generation of computers, it is we are using vacuum tubes, and then vacuum tubes were then further enhanced and developed, and were completely phased out due to its disadvantages, like it dissipates more heat, prone for failures, prone also for overheating, and consumes a lot of electricity. And thus, technology using the first generation computers are very expensive. Then in the second generation computer, the vacuum tubes were replaced with transistors. And without the invention of transistor, we could not have our 
computers which are very portable nowadays because it is the invention of the sister which paves the way for miniaturization of these devices. And in the third generation of computers, the transistors were then enhanced to create your integrated circuit. And then from integrated circuit in the fourth generation, it was further enhanced to create your microprocessor. And in the fifth generation, these computers are now using artificial intelligence and are now still in development. AI is still under process out on its way to the market. Right now, computers are belonging to fourth generation. So those computers capable of artificial intelligence, machine learning, they are now classified as fifth generation. And perhaps class, our smartphones are now using AI to enhance images taken by our camera and it now belongs to the fifth generation. We have the 5G mobile phones. However, in the fifth generation, applications like voice recognition are now being used today. AI are also called as thinking machines, which is a branch of computer science concerned of making computers behave like humans. And this generation is expected to be far more faster and more powerful than present models, which uses practical and efficient voice input. So I guess that's all for today's video lecture, and see you next for our next video lecture. Thank you and have a good day.